My name is Chris King. I'm a hospitalist at the University of Colorado Hospital, and this video is an ECG interpretation introduction for students starting the hospitalized adult care clerkship. The objective of this video is that we will identify a systematic approach to reading the rate, rhythm, and access on ECGs. Fully reading an ECG is actually a six-step system, but for this video we're going to start off with the first three, the rate, rhythm, and access. The intervals, chambers, and segments we're going to cover in TBL on Thursday. The other thing TBL is going to give us a chance to do is to practice, practice, practice. So you'll have a chance to practice rate, rhythm, and access, as well as intervals, chambers, and segments. So to start off, we want to figure out what the rate is. And there's two ways to do this. The first is to just count the number of QRS complexes across your ECG and multiply by 6. An ECG is 10 seconds, multiply by 6, that tells you how many beats per minute. So in this patient, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 times 6 is 84, so that's 84 beats per minute. There's another way that involves a little bit less counting, and that's to take the number 300 and divide it by the number of big boxes that are in between two R waves. So here we have one that's on this bold line here, which is exactly where we want to start. And you count one, two, three big boxes, plus a little bit more. So we'll know it'll be a little bit less than our calculation. So you divide by three, and that gives you 100. Now we said we knew it would be a little bit less, so you can bump it down to 90 beats per minute. You can see that this is a slightly inexact way of calculating it, whereas this way is a little bit more exact. If your patient has a low heart rate, they have bradycardia. If they have a high heart rate, then they have tachycardia. And obviously somewhere in the middle, they have a normal rate. So then you want to move on to figuring out the rhythm. The first step in figuring out the rhythm is to determine whether you have a narrow complex QRS or a wide complex QRS. And the dividing line is 120 milliseconds, or three small boxes. So a normal or narrow complex is less than that. If you have more than 120 milliseconds, that's a wide complex QRS, and that suggests that the conduction system is either not being used because your rhythm is originating in the ventricles, or something is wrong with the conduction system, such as a bundle branch block, so that in order to complete the QRS, there has to be some myocyte conduction. But in this patient, you can see that the QRS is very narrow, and so we have a narrow, complex QRS. Next, we want to figure out whether or not our rhythm is coming from the sinus node. So let's start looking at P waves and QRSs. And you can see that there's a P wave before every QRS and a QRS after every P which is exactly what you want to see if this is going to be a sinus rhythm. If that's not the case, it's not a sinus rhythm. But that's not all that you need. The next thing that you need to do is go to lead 2 and look at the P wave. If the P wave is upright in lead 2, then again, that is the next step in being a sinus rhythm. If instead it's inverted, then you don't have a sinus rhythm. The final thing to look at is if your P wave is upright, are all of the P waves in lead 2 of the same morphology. And in this patient, they are. So this is a normal sinus rhythm. But what if things don't look quite this clean? So in this patient, to figure out the rhythm again, start off by looking at the QRS. Narrow, complex QRS, great. Now let's see if our rhythm is coming from the sinus node. P wave before every QRS, QRS after every P, looking pretty good. Is our P wave upright in two? Well, that one looks good. So does that one. This one is not quite so upright, and this one is definitely not upright. So we're not going to be dealing with a normal sinus rhythm here. Now we got to figure out what it is that we're dealing with. So let's look at the last step. Do all of our P waves have the same morphology? And you can already tell this one and this one are different, which are different than this one, which is different than this one. So we have four different P wave morphologies. And if you count out the rate, you'll see that this is tachycardic. And so there's, there's actually four different foci in the atria creating this rhythm. So it's a multifocal atrial tachycardia, or MAT. Let's look at a couple other examples. So in this ECG, again, start off with 
your QRS. Narrow complex. Great. Now let's see if this is starting off in the sinus node. So we can see our QRS is here, and they maybe are preceded by a P wave every time, but it doesn't look like every P wave has a QRS after it. So now all of a sudden we already know that we're not going to be having a normal sinus rhythm. And if you've seen it before, this is actually a classic tracing of atrial flutter. So in this patient, the thing that gives it away is the fact that there are P waves without QRS complexes after them. And there are pretty defined P waves as well. <clears throat> Let's look at one more. So in this patient, again, start off with the QRS. Narrow complex, great. Now let's see if the sinus node is driving this rhythm. So we see our QRS complexes here, but I have a tough time picking out P waves. There's a T here and a T here, but I'm having a tough time making out any P waves in front of my QRSs, and you can actually go down here to lead two. I don't really see any well-defined P waves. So you'll also notice that the QRSs are kind of all over the place. And so this is actually atrial fibrillation. So that's all well and good when the QRS complex is narrow. We now have a good idea of what these things look like and how to go through a systematic approach to see if we have normal sinus rhythm or not. But what happens when our QRS is wide? So in this patient, you can see that the QRS is much wider than our normal three small boxes. So we have a wide complex QRS. <clears throat> so we already know this is not going to be a normal sinus rhythm, but is the sinus node still driving this? In order to do that, we go back to lead two. And we say there's a P wave before every QRS. Even though our QRS isn't normal, there's still a P wave before it and a QRS after every P wave. We then look in lead two again and see that our P waves are upright. So again, that's a pretty good sign, though this might be the sinus node driving it. And in all three instances, these have the same morphology. So this is actually a good case of the sinus node driving the rhythm, but the QRS complex is abnormal. I can tell you that this is a left bundle branch block, and that's what this looks like. This is very classic for that. So what we have here is the sinus node is driving the rhythm, and it's trying to go through the normal conduction system, but unfortunately part of it's knocked out and so there's myocyte conduction that's widening our QRS complex and making it abnormal. All right, one more example of rhythm. So again in this one, start off, I'll tell you, this is a QRS complex and it's pretty wide. Now the next thing you want to do is look at lead two and say, are there any P waves? Are there any QRS P wave interactions, and I can't tell you that there's a P wave anywhere in here. I can't even tell you where a baseline would be. This is actually ventricular tachycardia. So as you can see, there's a very wide complex, and what's happening is that the electrical signal is actually starting in the ventricle. It's only using myocyte conduction, so none of the native conduction system is being used, which is why our QRS complexes are so wide. And since you can't tell anything about the P waves or to tell us if there's any sinus involvement, that's what tips you off that the ventricle is driving this. All right. So now that we have a fairly decent idea of what to look for when we're looking at rhythm, let's move on to axis. And for axis, all, all you really need is lead one and lead two. And what you want to do is look for where's the majority of the deflection in the QRS complex. So for instance, in lead one, it points up. We call that positive. If you want to see what negative deflection looks like, just look over here in V1, or in V2, or in V3. All of these are negative deflections because the majority of the deflection points down. But for axis, again, lead one, lead two. So in this patient, it's up in one, and up in two, and that is normal. But what happens if we have up in one, just like this patient, and down in two? Well, it turns out that that is left axis deviated. And if you flip those and say down in one and up in two, that's right axis deviated. There's one more iteration of these arrows, and that is that they're both downward deflected. This is pretty rare. It doesn't happen all that often. 
and it's extreme right axis or northwest axis. Again, you're not going to see that that often, but it's good to know that it exists. And that's all there is to figuring out the axis. So now that you have a system for the rate, rhythm, and axis of an ECG, write down what questions you have, write down things that are concerning you. On Thursday, we're going to get together in TBL and we're going to give you guys a chance to practice. Then we're going to introduce intervals, chambers, and segments, and then again have more practice. By the end, you guys will be reading uh, EKGs like pros, and you'll have a chance to practice every day when you're on the wards. Thanks.